going to go to the presentation from Jeremy Roth Kuschel, uh, another, another guy with Jewish heritage he expresses in other ways than insane uh, tribalism and support for Israel. In fact, Jeremy Roth Kuschel is one of the great truth tellers of our time, just like you, Alan, and uh, other members of our panel, actually. Jeremy with We Are Change Los Angeles was involved in confrontations of many important people uh, getting in their faces and telling them truths, often 9-11 related truths and making videos that would go viral on the internet. And then Jeremy was made uh, another uh, kind of history by being maybe the first person ever arrested for asking a question uh, during a library Q&A at the Kansas City Public Library, mentioning your name, Alan Sabrosky's name that is, and uh, getting himself <laughs> dragged off by uh, militarized trained Israel off-duty police operating as security at that public library. Well, Jeremy is going to be, he's also, I should mention, he's a co-host with me at False Flag Weekly News uh, alongside Dr. Anthony Hall, who's now in an academic freedom battle up at the University of Lethbridge. Uh, Jeremy has done a lot of interesting research on Talpia, this Israeli high-tech program that may be a part of this masterful Zionist strategy that uh, Alan Zabrowski was just talking about. So uh, let's hear it from the man himself. Welcome, Jeremy Roth Kuschel. Good to have you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Uh, um, I definitely uh, am very appreciative and uh, feel privileged to be on this panel with my fellow co-panelists who have done uh, in very important public work that I um, appreciate very much. And uh, as per uh, previous uh, Dr. Sabrowski uh, saying, maybe I should be uh, careful about uh, being dragged off after uh, his presentation, I had to go and change my shirt because I sort of sweated out my previous one because it's pretty hot here in the, what I would call the radical middle of America. And that's both uh, po politically and uh, geographically. And while I was changing my shirt, I took a look out the window and I saw no black vans approaching, not yet. Or maybe maybe white vans, maybe I should be looking for white vans. Um, but before I start, I wanna say that I, I actually believe that our situation is might be both worse than Dr. Sabrowski says, and also potentially better in terms of the po possibilities. Um, and uh, so in working into that, though, I want to take a step back and identify myself as a Jewish American patriot of conscience. In, in so doing, I mean to say that politically, I'm an American. My background in terms of family, uh, certain aspects of culture, uh, some religious upbringing is Jewish. I'm also from Los Angeles, so I have a little Mexican influence in there from my mom's side, uh, from the uh, Tata Umada uh, Indians of northern Mexico who are known for uh, making violins and running long distances. And, uh, and I bring that up to say that uh, the, 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 the facts that I want to bring to our attention here are meant for the idea of truth force, Satyagraha the healing power of truth. And that's on behalf of all of the people of the planet. Politically, I speak as an American. Uh, culturally, in uh, some background, I speak in some ways as, as on behalf of Jewish people. And, but intellectually and spiritually, I speak for humanity, both our humanity inside and our humanity abroad that is being uh, so violently attacked at this point. So let me get into this. This is a, a, a very wide ranging issue that has a lot of details that I don't have the full coherent grasp on all of them. But the overarching view is very, very uh, coherent, I believe at this point. And that is, is that there is a long-term Israeli military intelligence strategy to dominate uh, the planet and in the and in, in the current version of it is through the cyber uh, world, through dominating the world's online technology, databases, uh, back doors, critical infrastructure, communications, and 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 so I want to just briefly map out some of the background of this. By basically, because what I'm saying ultimately is that there is a global conspiracy of what we might call, uh, or what I might call, the uh, deep, 
the Jewish deep state. And by saying the Jewish deep state, I mean to talk about a, a global power network that in, in modern day in Israeli intelligence would be usually termed as Sionim, global uh, helpers, mainly Jewish, all Zionist, all willing to do things to help uh, the power of the uh, Israeli state. But then we could also talk about the deep Jewish state. Israel defines itself as the Jewish state. And what we know about the, the idea of the deep state is that it represents the intersection of institutional state power, national so-called security power, and the uh, underworld, the, the black economy, the mob economy. And so in both these places, both the deep Jewish state represented by Israeli military intelligence, long-term technical intelligence in Israel, and the Jewish deep state, meaning the even longer term uh, global Jewish power networks that helped bring the Jewish state into existence, we see a long-term planning operation that is replete with conspiratorial um, intent and, and, and very often deceptive and violent. Uh, and increasingly, uh, this, I, I, in a short term, I, I would call this, and actually I get this term from Brendan O'Connell, who's the uh, very sharp Australian activist who brought this concept of Talpiat uh, to my attention. He calls it the biggest national security breach or big, biggest security breach in history. And I think he's correct about that. And for at least the last 150 years, I believe that this represents in many ways the largest US security breach, but increasingly in the 21st century, and onwards, it actually represents a global security breach of uh, increasing, uh, increasingly uh, negative proportions. So now I'm gonna flip into some notes uh, so you can fo follow me as I proceed. And I'm gonna run through a lot of facts because I wanna bring in some of the, the deep background to understanding our, our context here. Because in many ways, I, uh, I agree with Dr. Sobrowski in terms of making connections, rethinking how we might approach uh, September 11th. Um, and in terms of September 11th, I believe that September 11th remains both the, the Achilles heel of those forces that we need to uh, lawfully uh, apprehend. And I also believe it represents the philosopher's stone to understand this larger context. So I guess my disagreement in many ways might be that from, as we saw aspects of the truth movement, and I appreciate very much uh, Gilad Atzmon's attention to the complexity of the truth. And once you see truth movements, you see control. And so what we've seen is the some movement, some organic authentic movement in the midst of this control from what happened, to who did it, and now I would say we need, it's, it's essential that we make the connection to why it was done. And we know, we know a lot of the background in terms of the greater, uh, greater Israel plan, Oded Yunon. We know about the expansion of military bases. We know of Ray McGovern's uh, OIL, uh, oil. Now we know from the Gary Vogel book uh, about oil that the oil, agenda was actually for Israel, and then I being for Israel, and then L for logistics, meaning long-term military logistics in that part of, of the, uh, the world. But I also think that there's a part of the 9-11 agenda, the why, that has not been uh, fully uncovered. And I believe that's actually the focus of this presentation, that, it ha that a lot of it had to do, we've, we've seen this idea of the ramping up of cyber surveillance, cyber security, aspects of the police state here in the so-called homeland. But I would actually assert that that might have been the biggest long-term reason uh, an Israeli military intelligence uh, uh, incentive for September 11th was to supercharge their potential cyber domination of the planet uh, in, in a, a corporatist economic fashion. And so we'll get into that. So Talpiat in Unit A200, the global cyber agenda for kill switch domination. 
So Talpiot, what is Talpiot? Talpiot was a, uh, a program that was set into motion after the Israelis suffered heavy losses in the wake, uh, in the wake of the uh, Yom Kippur War in 1973. Some, some professors, a psychologist uh, approached uh, the Israeli Air Force and then also Rafi Aitan, the uh, infamous Israeli intelligence uh, uh, leader, uh, to, that they thought that Israel needed to think longer term. So what it is, the Talpiat program essentially and in many ways, we're actually using the idea of Talpiat, I would say, as a shorthand for a much larger agenda that is even precedes the actual program itself. But Talpiat itself, you could imagine it as a special forces uh, combined with engineering uh, training program for the idea of managing strategic tech domination by uh, Israeli military intelligence. So they, they, the recruits, there are very few, there's just dozens a year. They do three years, uh, a little bit more than three years in physics, math, or computer science, while uh, simultaneously field training across all IDF branches. Uh, and then after that, they do six years of service in the IDF. Uh, and after that, about a third of the Talpiat tiers uh, remain in the uh, Israeli military, over the long term, about a third go into uh, go back into the academic sector, both in Israel and abroad, uh, a lot in the United States of America, actually. And then a third of them pursue the corporate route, the, the business route. Unit 8200 uh, is, is the Israeli NSA. It's been around longer than the Talpiat program. Uh, it, it was formed in the early 50s through way of uh, old uh, U.S. equipment, I believe. And it represents now the engineering force and the source for Israeli cyber power worldwide. In the book recently published by Ronan Bergman, Rise and Kill First, The Secret History of Israel's Targeted Assassinations, and that, that title comes from a, a Talmudic uh, uh, assertion, uh, about killing before you're killed. Uh, it, on page 597, it, it talks about how Meyer Dagan's Mossad, who's responsible for human intelligence, uh, was working with Aharon Zevi Farkash's uh, Amman, that's the Israeli military intelligence. He was also the, the previous head of Unit 8200 Signals Intelligence to combine forces into what they began to call Hugent, so the combination of human intelligence and signals intelligence. And one, uh, Yossi Cohen, I believe his name is, he's actually the current head of the Mossad. He was uh, critical to all of this. And one of the biggest things that we've seen produced by uh, Unit 8200, Israeli military intelligence, that we all have heard about is Stuxnet. And I believe that Stuxnet, in many ways, is a perfect example of this idea of Hugent or Hogan, I don't know how to exactly say it, but uh, human intelligence combined with signals intelligence, which I believe is also at the heart of what the Talpiot program represents long term. In that, we see the idea of uh, an industrial scale super virus that was uh, programmed by a, a collaboration between the NSA and Unit 8200, actually put on, uh, on a USB uh, smart drive. I believe, and uh, then uh, found ways through uh, assets or agents on the ground in Iran to find its way onto the computers uh, in, in Iran's nuclear program. Uh, this, it's interesting, too, to, to note that the USB drive comes out of uh, the bowels of uh, Israeli uh, technology. So the, I think this is a perfect example of it. So Talp the, the current uh, Talpiat Unit 8200 power is the result of the long-term planning of Israeli technical intelligence, which is known as LACOM, which was really formed by Shimon Perez uh, uh, back in the 50s in many ways. It was called the Bureau of uh, Science Liaison. So in the age of the ascent of cyber warfare, should we actually be talking about things like technological intelligence or cyber intelligence? So this, if you get anything from my talk, this is, this is what uh, I want you to get, is straight from the mouth of the, quote, crime minister Netanyahu. 
This is what he said just a few months ago. And I call him crime minister. The um, thousands of Israelis call him crime minister. So I believe it would probably be in the realm of new anti-Semitism if I didn't call him crime minister Netanyahu. So uh, a few months ago, uh, Netanyahu was on the Fox News uh, with Mark Levin. And this is, he laid out the purpose of this long-term planning uh, supercharged by the Top Yacht program when he said, quote, we not only do it for us, we share it with dozens of countries. We've prevented dozens of terrorist attacks, major terrorist attacks. So when you take security interest and intelligence that countries have to protect themselves against terrorism, and that's pretty much all countries, and you take the needs for technological the innovation that is driving the world right now, both of them are present in Israel, and so everybody wants them. And that gives me the third thing, which is this massive flourishing of Israeli, uh, Israel's diplomatic relations with just about every country in the world. Not all. We're not big on North Korea, and you know not too big on Iran, but just about everyone else. And so this is the triangle. It's economic power, security power, gives you diplomatic power. That will take a few years to transit itself into the votes of this archaic body called a General Assembly of the United Nations or some of the other bodies. It'll take a while until they get the news, but it's happening all over the world. So Israel has never been stronger militarily, economically, diplomatically, and it's a very deliberate policy, and it actually it begins with economics. He then more recently was quoted in a, a Times of Israel article titled, How Quantum Physics Can Make Israel More Secure. Uh, as saying, I will soon declare the technological scientific program to strengthen Israel's security, Netanyahu told science ministers and delegations from 25 countries at a convention in Israel. Quote, among other things, the revolutionary program will advance Israel in quantum technology. That field is vital for Israel's technology. Uh, Israel's intelligence. So quantum, quantum. putting aside the whole question of the scientific backing of quantum, I would ask people to actually look into the Iranian-born uh, scientist uh, Keshe, K-E-S-H-E, for alternative explanations of uh, deep physics. But what the technology behind quantum computing actually is, is clearly up and coming. Google is uh, starting to announce its uh, apparent uh, cyber, do uh, cyber domination of quantum. And what you see is just two major, uh, as far as I can see, the public quantum computing centers in the United States. The one I'm aware of is at USC in Southern California, and it's a combination of USC with Lockheed Martin and in Israeli is at the helm. So back to 1979 to say to when this all started. This is when there were the harbingers of 9-11, the global war on terror, agents sent out to the world, and the beginning of Talpiat. The Jerusalem Conference on International Terrorism, organized by then a younger Netanyahu. This was, of course, the architecture for the modern war on terror and the who's who of the, uh, the, some of the national security, so-called elite of UK, the US, were all there uh, in the Jerusalem Conference. It was also the year that the father of Israeli intelligence, Issa Harel, foretold the journalist Michael Evans, my last question was, would terrorism ever come to America? And Harrell said, quote, you have the power to fight it, he said, but not the will. They have the will, but not the power. All of that will change in time. Yes, I fear it will come to New York and your tallest building, which is a symbol of your fertility, unquote. 79 was also the year that Shaul Eisenberg, uh, Mossad, founder of Beit Asia and the Israel Corp, uh, sponsored a flight uh, of Israeli military uh, high level for the first time and did it very covertly to China. I mean, Shaul Eisenberg's important figure, people should go look into him. He was also a key figure in the Jew uh, Jewish community in Japan. Basically, uh, Israeli intelligence man for the Far East. And so this was sensitive both for Israel and for the Chinese, and so it was kept very, very secret. And so you can imagine that the, that the Israelis, as they were still deeply sucking at the U.S. teat, uh, did not want to uh, spook their U.S. sponsors too badly. 79 was also the year that one Yosef Bodansky, who was also LACOM, Israeli Technical Intelligence, uh, had arrived in the USA. Ultimately, he works then at Jinsta. Uh, he, he goes from uh, editing the Israeli Air Force's journal 
to uh, editing the uh, JINSA, Jewish Institute for National S Security of America, I think it's called now, uh, their journal. And then he ultimately makes his way into the government with help of basically Israeli moles and creates a, a center called the Technology Transfer Center. And 79 is the year the Talpiot program actually begins, the first class. So I, I don't have time to really go through all of this carefully, but I, this is the deep background that I would just uh, ask people to go look at, that there's this intelligence that Netanyahu talks about actually precedes the formation of Israel. I would say that it goes all the way back to things like the city of London, Rothschilds, in then in its progress into uh, Amman and Lakam. So in the, very, in the 1800s, you have the birth of the B'nai B'rith, in conjunction with Scottish Rite Freemasonry and the Knights of the Golden Circle were not only critical to the Confederate intelligence and, rat, and rats, uh, sort of rat lines from, uh, from the middle of America up into Montreal, but the, it has been said that they helped form the Ku Klux Klan. So these are the kind of facts that I believe might in multi, uh, a multicultural, multiracial uh, modern America that the people who like send the ADL, which is the birth child of the B'nai B'rith to uh, focus on race relations at Starbucks, people should hear about this. I think both African Americans and Jewish Americans might want to hear the allegation that the ADL of B'nai B'rith, that its parent organization, the B'nai B'rith, might be the father of the Ku Klux Klan. So certain figures to look into, Simon Wolf, Judah Benjamin, Albert Pike. At, later on, after the turn of the 20th century, you see similar characters, including Simon Wolf, who had been the head of the uh, B'nai B'rith, people like Bernard Baruch, uh, Edward House, Louis Brandeis, Felix Frankfurter, uh, the Supreme Court justices who have been uh, publicly outed in many ways by Alison Weir as the Parushim, the secret Zionist society, were orchestrating uh, for not only the potential Jewish occupation of uh, Palestine, but also the engagement in World War I by the United States in conjunction uh, with an agreement with their, their Rothschild sponsors in the city of London. But then you also have the UK, uh, which, which was also a spook's nest. There's the notorious Kim Philby. A lot is made of him as a Soviet spy. It's come out recently that he was a Zionist uh, mole and played a key role in, uh, in apparently uh, uh, distracting, uh, putting uh, UK and uh, MI6, I believe, on a fool's errand in order to set up the uh, King David hotel bombing for the Zionist. Victor Rothschild, who threw Kim Philby under the bus while after he was told about uh, Kim Philby writing uh, 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 two pro-Arab uh, journal articles by Flora Solomon, then Benenson, um, who actually was the daughter of a Rothschild-related uh, 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 Russian-Jewish uh, gold uh, broker, um, Victor Rothschild turns out that he was also apparently a Soviet mole. Was he also a Zionist? Well, very likely. Uh, so there you have that. And then moving to the US, we have the notorious James Angleton, who, who was basically the long-term solid asset of uh, Israel, even before it was founded, it looks like. And uh, this 56 Egypt invasion by Israel, the UK and France, w a Angleton was in the White House trying to convince uh, the president that there wasn't going to happen. And he was actually confronted by a CIA analyst and said that he was co already co-opted. And of course, he was proven to not be wrong, but probably be dissembling. But also, Angleton was the key player in, uh, in JFK, in the JFK assassination on the U.S. side that had to do a lot in terms of its intention about uh, Demona the creation of the Israeli nuclear weapons program, NUMEC, the Apollo plant in Pennsylvania. Uh, Angleton, as head of counterintelligence, looked obviously looked the other way as Rafi Aitan, uh, high-level Israeli intelligence, came into the country and I'm pretty obviously trucked and bartered American uh, uh, nuclear resources to help uh, Israel build its bombs. Um, and then, uh, and then uh, <laughs> Angleton was also there at the USS Liberty. And in, in terms of the, the uh, Six Day War in 1967, uh, there even the uh, elements of NSA didn't know how the USS Liberty got there. State Department didn't know. The White House apparently didn't know. I don't know if that's true, but the head of State Department intelligence blatantly said, I'll bet Angleton 
uh, was the one who put the USS Liberty there. He definitely helped in the cover-up. And then running through this very quickly, the ADL from the, its very inception apparently has been involved in spying. They were in, they spied on the nation of Islam looking for anti-Semitism. Instead, they found anti-racism, which included anti-Jewish supremacism. So they were, <laughs> they uh, put, kept some agents in there. They spied on Martin Luther King Jr. That was outed by a hoax child, I think his name was, a former ADL official in the 90s. Uh, all the way through Jonathan Pollard, the head of the ADL at that at that time, Kenneth Bialkin, who had formerly been the head of every major Jewish power organization you can think of, including the B'nai B'rith internationally, uh, was in place to try to run the cover-up, ran to Israel right after Pollard was arrested, and all the way into the modern era of the well-known 80s and 90s, probably ongoing spying of the ADL uh, on Palestinian solidarity activists, uh, even including U.S. senators, and then also anti-apartheid South Africa activists. Jinsa that I mentioned before has also been at the at the core of uh, of this spies nest from Richard Pearl and the previously am mentioned Yosef Bodansky to the more modern John Bolton and Michael Mokovsky, who's the current head, who is outed by Gary Vogler in his recent book. By the way, Go Jayhawks that was put out here by uh, KU Press. Uh, I'm more into uh, intellectual uh, uh, successes rather than hoops, but Go Jayhawks. Uh, Michael Mokovsky was outed by Gary Vogler in his book as a, a very likely uh, uh, agent of Israeli intelligence, maybe an officer. He, he doesn't have it on his biography that you can find, but Vogler says that Mokovsky, who was born in the U.S., born in St. Louis, actually, over here in Missouri, went to uh, Israel uh, to be in the Foreign Service for many, many years, in the 80s, I believe, and uh, Vogler says 98% of uh, Israeli Foreign Service is Israeli intelligence. So that puts Michael Mokovsky, who was also at the head of the Pentagon's uh, oil uh, uh, delegation uh, and operations uh, as basically being in charge of Israeli intelligence. And then moving quickly through the uh, Jonathan Pollard uh, uh, incident, there was a Mr. X group, a, a Mr. X that was left in place because uh, Pollard was passing the Israelis uh, documents that the Israelis already had the uh, the numbers on. So someone very high level at the Pentagon, very likely, or at some level in the U.S. national security apparatus had already given them what to look for. And so that Mr. X remained in place. But similar to the idea of mega, when uh, when Israeli intelligence was heard by NSA in the late 90s and during the Clinton administration to have uh, someone called mega on the inside, Mega probably turned out to be more than just an individual and turned out to be a group, just like Mr. X. Mr. X turned out to be something like an Israeli-Soviet long-term spy nest that apparently involves people like Pollard, Albert Wolstetter, Shabtai Kalmanovich, who was actually uh, outed as a Soviet agent in Israel, Harold Katz, who was the uh, apparent sort of financial manager of this whole situation through the idea of the, uh, the um, BIRD, which was the binational, uh, U.S.-Israeli binational industrial research and development uh, program that was set up and apparently run by Israelis. So I don't know what the U.S. was getting out of it. And then ultimately, even into such deep technology as people like Ben Rich, who I heard uh, CIA pilot John Lear uh, identify as a Mossad, uh, uh, as Mossad from a prominent uh, Jewish Filipino family. His son, Michael Rich, is currently head of the Rand Corporation, which is another piece of this apparent mole's nest, which uh, people have asserted includes uh, the Yoda of the long-term U.S. national security uh, set involving Rand called Andrew Marshall. And then the mega group finally was the turned out to have been an actually a group of Zionist Jewish billionaires that included the Bronfmans, whose daughters now are in, implicated in the NXIVM uh, uh, blackmail sex trafficking scandal, uh, having funded it to $150 million. Les Wexner, who was the uh, the basically the father the, the father sponsor of one Jeffrey Epstein the the epicenter of blackmail operations for Mossad and likely for aspects of CIA and FBI, uh, having actually given Jeffrey Epstein uh, his 
townhouse with cameras already installed, apparently. And then Michael Steinhardt, the sort of current dean of the uh, Birthright Israel program. Okay, so I'm going to rush through this. Uh, I'm not going to really discuss this too much. I don't think I have too much time left here. But this idea of security that Netanyahu mentioned as being part of this uh, long-term operation, I would say security grows out of a mushroom cloud uh, in terms of this long-term uh, uh, Jewish intelligence operation. Samson Option Point One uh, was the sort of hundred years ago operations of the people like the Parushim and the Simon Wolf, subterfuge, rumors of warmongering and bombs, which included, of course, the Jerusalem hotel bomb, but also included letter bombs to multiple uh, UK officials, but also to President Truman, which is a fact that I put on the record at the Kansas City Public Library two years ago before I brought up uh, Alan Sabrowski's name and got grabbed by a fusion center met Israeli trained partisan paid uh, uh, security so-called uh, guys. So Samson option 1.0 was, I would say, the, the, the early spying, uh, the false flag assassinations uh, of the 60s, including both of the Kennedys. Look at Laurent Guyano's work on that and the uh, macro nuclear threat as, as Israel went nuclear. And uh, I, I forgot to, to mention that Shimon Perez is, is part of the way that he um, got the French to, to um, help build Demona in the first place was he promised Israeli involvement in that 56 invasion of, of Egypt. And, uh, and so that, that, so, that, so in many ways, Shimon Perez is the, the real father of the Israeli nuclear program. And then, uh, and then Samson Option 2.0, more recently from the, basically the Jerusalem conference on, we're talking about this technology transfer that included this Pollard scandal that in many ways was a technology transfer not just to Israel, but to the Soviet Union in a big, 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 big way. Um, but also then the rise of false flag terrorism. We see the, the uh, 93 World Trade Center bombing, even elements of the o OKC bombing. Look at Michael Collins Piper's wor work on the OKC bombing in terms of, uh, of Israeli involvement in that. And then I would assert the usage of tactical micro nukes in terrorist attacks around the world, which apparently included lower Manhattan, uh, on September 11th, and look at the work of Joe Vial, as the Australian uh, uh, deceased journalist, about the Bali bombing. And then finally, Samson Option 3.0. This is the uh, contemporary Samson Option. It includes mass MK Ultra. The uh, conops. It's a term. It's uh, that I've that I've coined as sort of an alternative to psyops because the IDFs uh, has a section or a unit called the the unit for consciousness operations, and so I think it's a, a a larger perspective of the kind of psychological warfare that's being waged on us in the age of uh, Cambridge Analytica, Black Cube intelligence. Uh, Wikistrat, Psy Group, all of these very uh, current groups. But it's also when the Tall Piat and Unit 8200 went global and, and uh, Netanyahu can then uh, stand up at APAC and basically imply the power of kill switch diplomacy. Okay, I'm going to go a few more minutes if that's okay. Economics, fire up the firms with a little 9-11. So I'm going to... Uh, uh, read a quote from Netanyahu at this year's APAC that lays this out. Quote, now there are new industries. Israel is literally, how can I say this? Liter Israel is literally driving the world. I'm talking about autonomous vehicles. Israel is a world leader in autonomous vehicles. 500 tech companies that sprang up almost instantaneously. And one of them, Mobileye, up there on the left, was just sold to Intel for the paltry sum of $15 billion. But the interesting thing is that Intel said to them, quote, here are the keys to our 30 worldwide autonomous vehicle businesses. You run it, unquote. Israel technology is driving the world. And one last industry, there are many more, but one more that you're all familiar with. You have bank accounts. You should, okay? Well, you don't want anyone hacking into them, right? Or into your cars or into the planes you ride. You need cybersecurity. Everybody needs cyber. 
Israel has become a world leader in cybersecurity. So what percentage do we get of the world global investment in cybersecurity, in private investment in cybersecurity? We're one-tenth of 1% 1 of the world's population, and we get a whopping 20% of global private investment in cyber. We're punching 200 times above our weight. Not two times, not 10 times, not 100 times, 200 times above our weight. That's very strong, Netanyahu said. And so I would say that that looking into the uh, the the uh, second to last chapter in Naomi Klein's The Shock jo Doctrine, it was called Losing the Peace Incentive, Israel as Warning. And it laid out basically th that uh, the Israeli economy was on the verge of collapse, you know, similar in certain ways to the way that there was the dot-com uh, problems in the U.S., but this was much more pervasive. And before September 11th, the Israeli government propped up its cyber and switched it fully into security and counterterrorism. And then a few months later, September 11th, and Israel became the shopping mall to the world. Um, in, in James Banford's book uh, uh, about the, uh, the shadow factory, about the NSA, he talks about two key Israeli companies that were brought in uh, post-September 11th to wiretap the entire country. One is Naris, who was, which was co-founded by a Talpiat graduate, Morius Nacht, who was actually recruited out of a, a global Jewish uh, educational group called ORT. And then also uh, Verint, uh, which has a very interesting background and which has apparently been brought in all across the world, not only to wiretap uh, so-called the American people, uh, but also has been brought deeply into the heart of Chinese communications, uh, Mexico, the Southeast Asia, all around the world, uh, Israeli intelligence is in the back door uh, there. So that I think that there, there is some element, element of proof that the Israelis were not only uh, helped organize September 11th in a large, large way, but we're uh, preparing to take advantage of it in terms of this supercharger of their cyber economy, where now they're punching 200 times above their weight. And people can go look into things that the research uh, people like um, Christopher Bolin, who's written articles like, is Miter the Trojan horse of 9-11? Or did Mossad deceive the US military on 9-11? So P-TECH and Miter in the run-up to September 11th, were in the basement of the FAA. They were apparently put, all, that technology, which looks to have been uh, Trojan horsed by the Isra by Israeli military intelligence by way of an American scion in Massachusetts, uh, the, the son and grandson of uh, high-level uh, B'nai B'rith uh, Judeo Freemasons, uh, Go uh, Goffman, I believe his name is, was put into virtually all of the U.S. government's computers in the run-up to September 11th. And then one last thing on that point was the brothers Yuran, Amit Yuran, uh, who, who was uh, ultimately put in charge of the CIA's investment unit in QTEL after 9-11, was already the head of uh, cyber, uh, cyber consultancy and security for the Pentagon in the run-up to September 11th. Does any of this make actual loyal U.S. military, uh, both veterans and currently serving, angry? let alone all of the technology transfer that Israel has done to China and Russia all around the world? Man, I, it makes me angry as a Jewish American. So, and then finishing up here, the companies they'll look into are Verint, Naris, NICE, basically a lock on a lot of the police uh, databases, uh, technology around the country. Checkpoint, as Allison Weir pointed out uh, yesterday, is, is the Jewish Voices for Peace uh, leader, Vilkomerson, Rebecca Vilkomerson, her husband works at Checkpoint. That's a Talpiat company. Uh, Amdocs, they basically were doing a lot, all of the billing for American uh, communications prior to 9-11, Guardium uh, connected to the uh, P-TECH and MITRE cutout over there in Massachusetts. FST, that's related back to the former head of Israeli military intelligence in Unit 8200, uh, uh, Aharon Farkash Zevi, Zevi Farkash. I believe I, it's possible I before I got uh, grabbed after saying the uh, word Sabrowski in an American public library, I might believe... Uh, I and my friend Greg McCarran might have been subjected to an invisible uh, Israeli military intelligence checkpoint, potentially with the biometrics run by this company, FST. 
look into that. The very day after my arrest, uh, F FST and the uh, Jewish communities of North America put out a press release saying that FST was the preferred identity management contractor for all North American Jewish communities. Zen Technology, they manage uh, the uh, P, uh, what's it called? Uh, PSP, the uh, a PHP, the computer code. I'm not much of a cyber guy myself, but almost all, uh, you know, Facebook, I believe, is programmed on PHP. Uh, it was it was originally um, uh, developed by a European, and then quickly uh, it was taken over by uh, an Israeli company, Zen Technologies, and is managed by them to this day. Go look at the Rad Group. The Rad, a single company, a single group basically created a lot of the te technology around the world in terms of the back ends of, of things like VoIP systems. Tower Jazz Semiconductors, Mobileye, as mentioned before, M Systems, which is where I believe the USB stick came out of, and then the cutout aspects of P-TECH and MITRE. So as I said before, USB memory sticks are products uh, of uh, deep, uh, the deep bowels of Israeli military intelligence, PHP firewalls, Intel's ARC processor, quantum optics increasingly. Go look at the Weizmann Institute and the Talpiat uh, uh, graduates who are deeply involved in that there. Stuxnet self-driving cars, in motion identity, identity management, biometrics, VoIP, etc. And the institutions to look at are the Technion, which by the way, not all is now about to have a campus in Manhattan uh, by way of uh, uh, Bloomberg. Uh, they're com combining forces with Cornell to create a, a, a campus there. Hebrew University is the home university of Talpiot. The Weizmann Institute, they're uh, deep in the, in the quantum uh, optics, and then Barlon University. So diplomacy, kill switch diplomacy, the civilian carrot and the cyber stick. Uh, and so this it, this sort of wraps up the Netanyahu's own words, basically in a rollout of what all of this uh, power uh, is going to result in. And this is very recent that he's sort of uncloaking in many ways, I would say. Uh, so this is at APAC 2018. He says, quote, now here's how the dots connect. Because we have this tremendous capacity for security and intelligence, and because we have this tremendous capacity for civilian technology, for making the lives of people richer, safer, more productive, many countries are coming to Israel because they want to share with us these benefits. And that creates the third great change, which is a flourishing of Israel's diplomatic relations around the world. You know, when I joined the Foreign Service 105 years ago as the DCM to the city, Washington, the number two in our embassy, I think we had about 80 to 90 countries countries with whom we had diplomatic relations. Now the number is 160 and there are very few countries left. We went to Argentina, to Colombia, to Mexico, and they say, come back, come back. We want more. That is changing. All these countries are coming to us. India, China, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, all of them, Azerbaijan, Muslim countries. First time I visited Australia, tremendous, far away though. So we're coloring the world blue. And you know what? The numbers, you remember people talking about Israel's isolation? Pretty soon, the countries that don't have relations with us, they're going to be isolated. There are those who talk about boycotting Israel. We'll boycott them. So that's ultimately what we're looking at. And so then finally, what then, do, what then do we do about the, quote, biggest security breach in history, unquote? I would say, one, vigorously practice, preserve, protect, and defend our First Amendment protected rights. Because Dr. Sprosky is right, uh, Jewish power, Zionist power configuration, the Israeli military intelligence is coming for, for us. Pointed, he pointed out that South Carolina is already attempting to make that kind of speech illegal. Meanwhile, in North Carolina, Durham, the city council became the first city, I believe, to, uh, to ban their police from going to uh, train with uh, foreign militaries with an emphasis on Israel. So that is a good uh, opening shot in that aspect, I would say, of the American Intifada. So that is a good model. Let's, let's let that uh, move. Here in Kansas, a young Mennonite uh, math teacher, she was going to be not allowed to teach math at the state level because the Kansas uh, 
a state legislature had passed one of these anti-BDS laws. She, uh, with help from the ACLU, uh, won a first round battle in the courts and pushed it back. It's going to go back to the legislature. But these uh, represent uh, areas for organizing. And in order to do that, we have to protect our First Amendment uh, protected rights, which are all of them. All of them. And I believe that that some aspects of the federal case that I've I've now filed in relationship to what I believe was my unlawful arrest two years ago have to do with a highly coherent uh, and, and very wide uh, uh, violation of virtually all of the uh, protections of the First Amendment, including petition for redress of grievance, because the person I was talking to was a former ambassador. And I've exhausted a lot of my other uh, ways to uh, petition my government. I've uh, put uh, the information in, in the boxes of, of judges, in the, in the hands of governors, in the hands of the vice president. I've, gi I've, given, I've made notice of it to the head of the DOJ. Uh, and made made even the president aware of it on C-SPAN, uh, and uh, and definitely made my Congress people aware of it uh, over time. And so, in many ways, the, this is all I have left is to speak about it in public to former officials. And also, I believe religion might have been at, at play. The the man who arrested me, who'd not only been to uh, Israel for training, uh, who, but also was working in the local fusion center. He put an anti-Jewish bias code on my trespassing charge, which was uh, uh, which was uh, fraudulent in the first place. So I'm the wrong kind of Jew. I self-identified as a Jewish American that evening before I was arrested. So uh, it, it, is a, it is apparent that the entirety of the First Amendment was, uh, was violated that evening. We need to protect all of them. Press rights are our fundamental personal rights as found by the uh, Supreme Court almost 100 years ago. Number two, make boycott, divestment, and sanctions an issue of global national security and economics. Now, I agree with Dr. Sabrowski. Things like uh, just sort of boycotting uh, cultural institutions, it's good for the artists and the musicians to stand up, mainly because it impacts uh, people's education around the world. Uh, it's a good propaganda blow. Uh, but just And boycotting things like fruit or soda stream, that's not going to cut it. We need to reach out to the military the O-sworn military of our country and of the world, and to point out that this is the greatest national security breach in history and connect that to boycott, divestment, sanctions. And I, of course, am calling out Jewish Voices for Peace to make this a piece of it, uh, as well as what some of the good work that they started advancing around the dangerous exchange in terms of police uh, policing uh, uh, training in Israel. But really, I think this is where the rubber meets the road. If all groups that are putting forth boycott, divestment, sanctions won't take on the fact that Netanyahu is bragging about Israeli cyber dominance globally as front and center for the reason that we need to boycott, divest, and sanction uh, Israel, then I believe they will be proven to be frauds. Third, push hard for 9-11 truth, justice, peace, freedom, and dignity. There is some good movement here. The lawyers uh, in Manhattan are making uh, moves in terms of putting this into the hands of the uh, the attorney general in in, uh, in the Southern District of New York, I believe, this needs to we need to keep putting this uh, forward, keep organizing around 9/11 truth, justice, peace, freedom, and dignity. 9/11 truth, I believe, still remains. If we can turn it into justice, the way to unlock this entire entire dark dark uh, scenario that's facing us here, because it involves both domestic treason in the United States at the highest levels of our so-called oath-sworn government, but also apparently organized out of the offices of Israeli military intelligence and with the very likely major reason to help uh, supercharge the Israeli cyber sector. And then finally, permaculturalize the Pentagon. Maybe we need something like an eco Army Corps of Engineer version of Utopian, and I admit it's utopian, but in a day and age of when our ecology uh, is really on the verge, we need to uh, to uh, transform the most one of the most powerful institutions in the entire world, the Pentagon, which in, involves you know people who are very capable, who at some level are of good faith in terms of wanting to potentially protect their country, 
We need to turn that away from an instrument of war and away from an instrument of the worst aspects of Israeli military intelligence and into a positive force, both at home, rebuilding in our infrastructure, but also maybe abroad in terms of rebuilding our ecologies. And then finally, I don't know if I have time to read this, but I think people should look at the uh, Justice Louis Brandeis concurrence in Whitney v. California in, in 19. 27, uh, keeping in mind, of course, his Parushim secret Zionist uh, uh, secret society status. But uh, I'm going to read this unless I hear it differently, and I'll read it very quickly. I'll call this Let's Do Speak Truth Diplomacy. Quote, those who won our independence believe that the final end of the state was to make men free to develop their faculties and that in its government, the deliberative forces should prevail over the arbitrary. They valued liberty both as an end and as a means. They believe liberty to be the secret of happiness and courage to be the secret of liberty. They believe that freedom to think as you will and to speak as you think are means indispensable to the discovery and spread of political truth that without free speech and assembly, discussion would be futile, that with them, discussion affords ordinarily adequate protection against the dissemination of noxious doctrine, that the greatest menace to freedom is an inert people, that public discussion is a political duty, and that this should be a fundamental principle of the American government. They recognize the risk to which all human institutions are subject, but they knew that order cannot be secured merely through fear of punishment for its infraction, that it is hazardous to discourage thought, hope, and imagination, that fear breeds repression, that repression breeds hate, that hate menaces stable government, that the path of safety lies in the opportunity to discuss freely supposed grievances and proposed remedies, and that the fitting remedy for evil counsels is good ones. Believing in the power of reason as applied through public discussion, they eschewed silence coerced by law, the argument of force in its worst form. Recognizing the occasional theories of governing majorities, they amended the Constitution so that free speech and assembly should be guaranteed, unquote. And so this definitely should apply to our current U.S. government. I would ask those involved in our current U.S. government to listen to that, but maybe even more importantly, I would ask those involved in Jewish power networks and Israeli military intelligence, and then all those uh, Jews around the world who support those networks to take those words of Brandeis to heart. So thank you very much. Uh, it's been an honor to be on this panel. Thank you very much to the uh, organizers, uh, to, to Kat and all of the organizers, to Alan for running the boards. And thank you, Kevin, for uh, holding it down here. And thank you so much to my fellow co-panelists. And here are some resources I'll uh, keep on the screen for people to look at. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jeremy Roth Cushell. That's an incredibly informative presentation. Uh, very, very important. So we're now into the Q&A period. And since we don't have any panels coming after us, we can just go ahead and extend our time a little bit and try to get to as many of these questions as we can. Uh, I think we could easily go for at least another half an hour. So let's go ahead and get going. Uh, we have questions coming in from audience members. Uh, the first question is for Alan Sabrowski from Peter. And Peter says, the, uh, as, as Alan says, the official Red Cross numbers are 300,000 total dead from Nazi concentration camps. Isn't the real denial then, denial in quotes, the real, uh, the willful silence, even by the Red Cross itself, of the actual verified numbers of the so-called Holocaust victims? Sounds like a it rhetorical question. Yeah. <laughs> um, there, were, there were two studies put out by the Red Cross on this. There was a three volume study in 1948, which included that number. There was a second edition that came out in the 1960s, which excluded that table. And I think the difference is that one would have to look at who is funding the Red Cross and where its funds come from. Uh, I don't know. I haven't looked at it. That just occurred to me. Yeah, the, the, that would be interesting to know. But the ICRC has been remarkably silent on the entire issue. Um, and the only reason people would be silent was because the understanding would be that the consequences 
for their funding, their leadership, or both would be fairly catastrophic. Okay. I'm sure, I imagine that's absolutely right. Next question, I guess, Alan, you could probably take this one too, and then maybe somebody else could jump in as well. This is from Jen. And uh, she said that, Alan, you said there's not a lot of Jewish lobby presence in China. Well, maybe not a lobby, but aren't the Israelis all over China, including stealing U.S. technology and selling it to China? Of course, Jeremy touched on some of that. Absolutely. I think that's true. Um, I learned a lot from listening to Jeremy. And in fact, Jeremy, are you there? I am here. Um, if you wouldn't mind having, uh, having a day or two with an old man, I'd love to brainstorm with you for a couple of days. I'm serious. That's a lot of information there. You have a lot of information at your fingertips. And it's an area that I don't do much work with. I mean, technology is something that I, let me give you an example. When it comes to cars, I turn on the ignition, I put gas in it, and anything more than that is a mystery to me. It really is. Uh, but you explained it very clearly and very coherently. And this is a very serious invitation. We'll exchange emails. Kat, we can do it through you. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to work out an arrangement as soon as possible to put a day or so with you and just brainstorm. I think we'd, I'd, have, I'd learn a lot. And I would me like too. to. Me too. I think I'd learn a lot too. And, I you know, we're, we're different fields. We're different fields. We're same topics. Would be good to look at that. Uh, so we'll coordinate with that. Jen, I, I think that's very true. But um, and I think that Jeremy probably would have a better handle on it. Intelligence, yes. Corporate, yes. China, China is in a sense uh, an Asia specialist of mine described China as a sponge. It will a gigantic sponge. It will take knowledge and information and technology from anyone. The reciprocity is not there, and China still, in fact, has a sense of its own future. Uh, I don't know the extent to which that would compromise or sec undercut the, the Israeli role, but it is certainly there. Uh, I expect China to be the great power at the end of the century. Jeremy? And maybe... Yeah. Yeah, maybe. Okay, go ahead, Jeremy. Well, I, I think that's probably very much correct in that clearly there, there's not the, the Jewish lobby is not so present in China, partially because there's not so much uh, Jewish people in China. There's some and it's very high level. And the exchange between Israel and China is very, very deep and very, very intense. If you look at one one Belt, One Road or the Belt Road Initiative, Israel is deep in the background in terms of providing the security for that. At the same time, I think you're correct, Dr. Sobrowski, that China takes its own security sovereignty pretty seriously, even after having given over their uh, civilian sector communications to Verint, uh, Israeli intelligence, basically. They now actually have created a quantum uh, computing uh I think for probably for the government and military sector to be able to communicate in ways that are un, uh, unbreakable potentially. So that suggests what you're saying that at some level, they're not going to give uh, the Israelis the uh, keys to the entire kingdom while at the same time, they are in bed with people like Eric Prince, who's tied very much in through Trump and Netanyahu. Uh, they are, it, Eric Prince's new company, Frontier uh, Consulting Services, has high-level Chinese folks on the board, and they are uh, going to be doing what they call logistics as an extension of military contracting all throughout in relationship to Belt Road, but also through Southeast Asia and then ultimately into Africa. Mm -hmm.